Welcome to another edition of the Giants Little Podcast. My name is John Schmelk. Today's guest, Mike Floyo from Pro Football Talk. But first, a reminder, the Giants Little Podcast is brought to you by PSE&G, energy efficiency for game time and anytime. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. All right, in this podcast, guys, you know, Mike and I are going to throw some numbers around. I just want to make sure that it's not construed as me advocating for, you know, any type of number that Daniel deserves, the Giants should offer, that he should uh, request. You know, we're just talking about what this negotiation might look like and, and how it might go. Uh, I'm certainly not in a position to, to try to negotiate for the organization or the player. So uh, we're throwing out hypotheticals, just kind of figure out exactly what's going on here, what was behind some of Mike's reports from earlier in the week. And it should be a lot of fun to kind of get a feel for how this might go uh, with a little less than two weeks now left on that franchise tag deadline. All right, let's get to it. And now we're joined by Mike Florio. He's the head honcho over Pro Football Talk. He had, uh, And, of course, he does a show on NBC Sports as well. And he had a report earlier in the week uh, talking about Daniel Jones switching agents and what that might mean for the Giants and their offseason. Mike, what's going on, man? How are you? Hey, great to be with you. I've been called many things. Head honcho is a rarity. I like it. I should get some business cards. Wouldn't that be great to just go around and pass out business cards that has your name and just says head honcho underneath? I mean, you give me an idea. This is already worth my time. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Very good. All right. I'm, I'm going to read from your report here, Mike, and then I kind of want to dig into exactly what some of the language means here. Uh, so this is what you wrote earlier in the week. Typically, a player who terminates his representation must wait five days before signing with a new firm. CAA, we're told, waive the five-day period as to Daniel Jones. So what does Jones want? There are two possibilities. One, he's willing to do a deal for less than CAA was willing to accept, or two, he wants more than CAA was able to get. As one source explained, it's the latter. Jones wants more than the Giants have offered, possibly as much as $45 million per year or more. So I guess the word I want to dig into is possibly, right? Uh, can you just explain to me, is that you know is that something that him and his new agency have discussed that he wants? Can you just kind of dig into that a little bit for me? Sure, and I have to be careful because I never want to reveal sources. But uh, Right, and, know, and, 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 and by the way, just, to, and just for the record, I'm not asking for your sources, obviously. Okay, and I appreciate that, but I, I want to preface it for myself because if I don't say it, the next thing you know, I've said too much. Of course. But um, here's the reality. Things like this happen, and then you start to get dribs and drabs and bits and pieces of the official versions after the fact. And you know, one of the things I've heard after the fact is, well, no formal offers were ever exchanged between Jones and the Giants. Okay, fine. But that doesn't mean informal numbers weren't bandied about. There of has course. been a sense that momentum was building toward the Giants getting a deal done for Daniel Jones. And the loose understanding has been in the range of $35 million per year. And when you look at the non-exclusive franchise tag, $32.416 million, a long-term deal with an average value of $35 million is in line with what the tag would get him on a multi-year deal. So then out of the blue at a time when there were reasons to believe that things were progressing, even if formal offers had never been exchanged, everyone's on the same page until they're not. And to have Daniel Jones choose to move from CAA to athletes first so abruptly and so close to the moment where it's time to put pen to paper that implies that there what you do, he didn't just roll out of bed one day and say, boy, you know, I've had this agency for the last four years and we're really getting close to the time to start negotiating. But you know what? Before we do, I'm not even going to give them a chance to do it. I'm going to fire them and hire somebody else. Common sense tells us that we don't get to the point that Daniel Jones changes agents unless he's hearing from his current agency numbers, concepts, ranges he doesn't like. That's what prompted the change. And now Athletes First is going to try to get him more. And look, does $45 million sound excessive? Well, yes, because Patrick Mahomes makes $45 million, but he chose to make less. The market is always going up. The salary cap is always going up. And we always think of this in terms of how much a player makes. And we were like, oh, my God, that's too much. Well, right, but the owners are making, <laughs> making more. We never focused on that part of it, that the revenue keeps going up, that the rising tide keeps lifting all boats. We look at what one of the boats is worth and we say, that's an awful lot. Well, look at all the other boats in the sea. 
everybody's making more. So 45 million isn't crazy when you think about how he played last year and the leverage that he currently has. And the reality that if he wants to, he could do the Cook Cousins thing, play this year under the tag, next year under the tag, and walk away as a free agent. And that may be how this all plays out, given where we are right now. Yeah, and look, and you actually led me exactly where I was going to go next, right? Because you do those two tags consecutively, you get to around like 71 and a half million, right? So that's give or take 36, between 35 and 36 per. So I guess for Giants, for the Giants, even for Jones, right, where he had one really good year, you want to see what he does in a second year with maybe some better pieces around them before you want to do a you know big money long term commitment for Jones as a quarterback. To your point, it's always getting reset the market with Herbert and Burrow coming up, Lamar Jackson coming up. You know, you look what Dak Prescott did. He three year deal. He wants to be able to hit it again. Do you think where this could wind up if it's not the tag is kind of like a shorter deal, almost maybe kind of what Derek Carr signed a couple years ago, where it's for a little bit more money. The Giants have a way out. Jones has a way to cash in sooner. Do you think if they don't do a tag and they do figure a deal out, would it be something in the shorter range or would it be a longer term deal? Well, there's a certain point where Daniel Jones just needs to say, I'll bet on myself. And we always love it when guys bet on themselves, because if they win, we can applaud and take some satisfaction in seeing a guy bet on himself. And if they lose, we just say, oh, well, it's not our money. But, you know, for him, you look at thirty two point four one six million this year, fully guaranteed if he gets tagged. 20% raise for next year. And you're right. The sum of the two years with the 20% raise is 71. And then third year, one of the reasons why Kirk Cousins didn't get the third year is the bump is 44%, not 20% in the third year. And I ran the numbers earlier this week. It's right around an average of 42 million over three years if you do three tags. And maybe they would do three tags. And even then they're south of what he wants if he wants 45 million. So- the Giants have the luxury here, and this kind of plays right into their hands. We get to take another year and see if last year was the aberration or the rule, and then maybe we can do another year. And the moment he falls off, we're proven right. If he keeps playing well, we'll gladly give him $45 million. Now, the market's going to keep changing, and the number's going to keep going up, but it's easier to justify it if he su sustains the success that he showed in 2022. So... I don't think if I'm him, I wouldn't want to do a short term deal. I'd want to go year to year because if they offer me a short term deal, the best I'm going to get is what I would get the next two years under the franchise tag, 71 million over the first two years. And then how do you deal with year three? Uh, I, I would I, if I'm con and you, you know, look, we know that all NFL quarterbacks and all NFL players. They're, they have to be confident or they wouldn't be able to go out there and do the job. They have to be confident to the point of delusional. If I'm Daniel Jones and I'm faced with a short-term deal, I just as soon say, I'll do tag this year, tag next year, and let's see what happens in 2025. Yeah, I guess I asked about maybe a potential two-year deal, for example, because there's no guarantee the second tag's coming, right? You know, let's say Jones misses seven, eight games due to injury, which is not unprecedented. He has done that before, right? And the Giants are uncomfortable with, you know, 38 or 39 on that second year tag. If he does a two-year deal, you know, maybe he won't get two both years fully guaranteed, but you would get more guaranteed in that two-year deal than you would just on their one year of the tag. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's that's a good point. And the question becomes, are you willing to make that commitment when you know I could go this year and get 32 next year? and get whatever it is, 35, 36, 37, uh, whatever the 20% bump is. I think like 38, I'll, seven, I think something like that. Yeah. Right. Cause it's got to add up to 71, but I'll take, let's just say 71 for two years, but then what happens after that? Now, right. if you would structure a two year deal with a commitment that he doesn't get tagged in the third year, that may be attractive then. And cause that's how Dak Prescott's four year deal was structured. The way that it voids, the way that it ends, there's no way that they can tag him after that fourth year. So if that's the quid pro quo, I'll commit to two years of franchise tag salary. But after year three, we're going to have this thing end in a way that guarantees I won't be tagged either franchise or transition. That may be acceptable to Daniel Jones. Then the team takes on some of the injury risk. They take on the risk that he wouldn't be any good this year and they would decide not to tag him next year. And then he's able to walk away after 2024 unless they would sign him to a new contract. And at that point, 
it would be a contract that better reflects market value. I mean, look, the bottom line is the franchise tag is bad for players because it keeps them from realizing their market value, either from their own team or some other team. It gives you squatters rights, usually for less than what the market is. 32.4 is far below what the current market is for quarterbacks at the high end. So that that if you could do that, if the Giants would do that, and it's a fascinating question, would they do that? If they would do that, that would be not a bad deal for Daniel Jones. And I think what Derek Carr gets will be interesting, too, and that might dictate, too, I think, some of that shorter-term negotiations. Last one on Daniel before I jump over to Saquon, Mike. What can you tell me about his new agents? I know it's not the same agents that Dak had at Athletes First, right? But it's the same agency. What can you tell me about how they operate and, and what they might – or how might they prefer to try to structure a deal when they eventually try to get one done with Daniel? Well, I, I – look, it, it's not like – Daniel Jones went from group of wet behind the ears, greenhorn agents to I'm in pop shop <laughs> established. Right, right. He he just he went from one of the top agencies to another of the top agencies. And and I try not to ever list the top agencies because then you leave somebody off, somebody gets pissed off. You got to spend all day on the phone with this. Why didn't you mention <laughs> me? Like with Lamar Jackson, I've said all along he needs to have a good agent. And it, it doesn't take a whole lot of work to start listing the good agencies. And for Lamar Jackson, if he was ever going to consider agencies, CAA and Athletes First are two of the agencies he should consider because they would get him the deal that he deserves. And more importantly, they would give him good advice on why you take the best offer that's on the table or how you go about engineering things to get what it is you're looking for. Athletes First got the five-year fully guaranteed deal for Deshaun Watson <laughs> with 20 plus civil lawsuits hanging over his head. So both firms can get the job done. My point is, in my opinion, there isn't enough of a difference between athletes first and CAA for Daniel Jones to think that they're going to get him anything other than what CAA would have gotten him. All they're going to get him is the franchise tag. That That's the end result here. Whatever deal CAA could have done or would have done is going to be comparable to whatever deal athletes first could have won, could have done or, or will do. But for whatever reason, Daniel Jones felt like it was in his best interest to make the change, and he's got every right to do it. But I'd be very surprised if whatever CAA would have gotten is going to be all that different than what Athletes First does get. So so I guess the theme would be then, just a quick follow-up, is that he's comfortable on the franchise tag, right? Because if you're going to shoot for the stars, you have to be ready for that to be your fallback, right? One of the arguments that I make in my book, Playmakers, I apologize for the gratuitous plug, no, but please, you know, go ahead. It, it, it fits here because – the franchise tag, as I mentioned earlier, is bad for players. It is. But there are still ways a player can use it to his advantage. Like Kirk Cousins did. Like Kirk Cousins did. And Tremaine Johnson, that same year, cornerback, he had been tagged twice by the Rams, hit free yeah. agency, got a big contract from the Jets. It didn't last long, but that, but you know, the farther you are away from the football, the easier it is to go year to year. Somebody asked me earlier this week about Deron Payne, the commander's defensive tackle, who is likely to be tagged, 99.9% .9 likely. Well, for him, two years of tag, there's no guarantee you're going to be healthy enough, effective enough, because you're in the scrum. You're in that, that twister game of bodies where it's amazing legs don't get broken more often than they do. It's a rarity, but you know all that force and pressure. Quarterback, they're the most protected player on the field other than the punter or the kicker. So you can do that if you're Daniel Jones. And you can take some solace in the idea that I'll go through two years of the tag. They didn't pick up my fifth-year option, so I got six, same as Kirk Cousins. I got six years, and I'm still on the front end of my prime. I can go into free agency. I can dictate my terms, assuming they don't tag me a third time. So that's a way that players can weaponize a thing that has always been a weapon the teams use to keep the best players off the open market. So if I'm Daniel Jones, yeah, I go into this fully comfortable and confident that I'll play under the tag this year. If need be, I'll do it next year. And then I become a free agent in year three, or you pay me enough in year three that I will have made 40 million a year plus over the, the past three seasons. All right, let's go to Saquon here, Mike. And I, I think this is fascinating. The running back market has been on a decline, right? And it's such a rich running back market this year with guys in free agency. Miles Sanders, David Montgomery, Josh Jacobs, and throwing, you know, guys like Kareem Hunt 
Alexander Madison. Like these are guys that could be starters for teams. Plus it's a very strong draft class. I've heard people tell me five or six starters could come out of this draft class in, in the early and mid rounds. So if Saquon does have to hit the free agent market and they do franchise Jones, I mean, I don't see him getting a McCaffrey offer. Is he, I mean, does he get to 14? Is it going to be around 12? I'm really curious to see how much people are willing to pay a premium for a guy like Barkley when there are so many other options out there that would probably cost less. Yeah, my gut tells me that it would be something in that range of 10 to 12 with kickers in there based upon ability to play. Because look, you know, guys like Saquon Barkley and Christian McCaffrey when they're injured, fans want to say they're injury prone. Well, no, the players aren't injury prone. The position is prone to injuring right. players. You are running into that scrum of bodies I was talking about earlier. You are you are in car crash after car crash. That's what Chris Sims refers to it as. These are car crash hits that running backs take. So the nature of the position is you have a high injury risk. And because of that, the teams don't want to have a lot of money tied to any given player, knowing that there is a very real risk that the player is going to get injured. And just because Saquon Barkley emerged from 2022 unscathed doesn't mean that he won't suffer an injury week one of 2023 or like he did early in what was it 2019 where he sprained his ankle against the Buccaneers and he wasn't the same the rest of the year and then he had the torn ACL in 2020 and then 2021 is coming back from the torn ACL so it was four years between great seasons truly great seasons that's a lot of money to pay for the reality that the risk of the position is that you're going to have injuries inevitably. I don't care who it is. Emmett Smith is the one guy I can think of historically, at least over the past 30 years. Tomlinson, maybe? Able to maybe Ladanian? Keep, who's that? Uh, Tomlinson. Ladanian Tomlinson was yeah. pretty healthy. At you least keep early in his going, career. you keep going, you keep going, yeah. you keep going, despite all of it. Adrian Peterson, to a certain extent, but he missed plenty of time due to injury. You know, he had a week two, uh, 2016, with the Vikings, a meniscus thing that knocked him out for most of the rest of the year. So, I think that it would have to be something that, you know, has a, has a healthy but not excessive base amount and then extra money in there that would be tied to playing, be tied to yardage. And you're right. Look, you're paying a lot for the name at this point because you can you can be dollar for dollar. You can get equivalent talent. Uh, you can you can draft a guy nobody's ever heard of who could right. be as good as Saquon Barkley this year. And the fact that nobody's ever heard of him. Okay, we will hear of him when he's the guy who is creating the highlights and scoring the touchdowns. That's how it works. And that's why I think teams migrated away from the workhorse tailback approach to having two or three guys, because then you don't have that one star player that you politically feel compelled in order to keep your fan base happy. All those people who have the guy's jersey, all those people that have him on their fantasy team, we have to keep him. We can't let him go. And I think Sean Alexander was the first guy that, really caused teams to start to say that there's a mistake in going all eggs in the basket with one guy, because then we have to pay him. And then the bottom drops out of the basket and we're stuck. And it's not the player's fault. If it happens, the game catches up to you when you are in those car crash hits all the time. So it's going to be a fascinating experiment. Cause I really do think if they could get a deal done with Jones, they would tag Barkley. And from Jones perspective, if he wants to be as good as he can be, it probably helps to have Barkley around. But if it's not Barkley, it's going to be somebody else. And uh, there's a chance that somebody else will end up being pretty good if you're blocking for him. And, and this is the key. There's This is an epiphany that I had 20 years ago because I used to go all to the West Virginia University home games. Every year there was a guy who could play in the NFL, a running back. If you can block for him, if you can count on him not to fumble the ball, and if you can trust him to pick up blitzers, there are pl the supply far out ways to demand and that's what's working against Saquon Barkley now all right so I think you actually brought this full circle pretty well with your comment there about you know Jones wanting the most around him to maximize his future value right especially if he gets tagged so what do you think the best way is for the Giants to try to get the most out of Daniel Jones because I think last year's year was good but the the production especially passing wise wasn't phenomenal because you mentioned it the wide receivers weren't great the protection wasn't great he made a lot of not a whole lot around him. So what do you think the best path is for the Giants here, Mike, this offseason? Put your GM hat on now to build around Jones with the resources they have available to them, with Barkley potentially a free agent, staying or leaving, uh, to try to get the most out of Jones to see if he can be a top seven or eight quarterback that you can invest that big contract in over a long period of time. 
Well, clearly help is needed at the receiver position. Now, I know that they're happy with what they found in Isaiah Hodgins, and he's developing into a good player, but you still need more quality pass catchers. They need to admit the mistake on Kenny Galladay and move on, obviously. Um, but, you know, the, 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 the one thing this Giants team has in common with the teams that won a couple of Super Bowls over the past 15 years, offensive line, defensive line, and that, that that's – it's cliche, but – that's what drives a good team. When the offensive line is playing really well, the skill position players and the quarterback get all the, the glory, but it's because you have an offensive line that is able to buy them time to do what they need to do. And then when you have a defensive line that is becoming increasingly disruptive as this one is, that makes it easier to get the other offense off the field, get the ball back to your team, create some points off turnovers, get good field position, et cetera. But I think that, if we want to see Daniel Jones fully and completely develop, they need to upgrade the the core of pass catchers. That's the next step here. And, uh, and, and this is part of the tension. It's kind of becoming like the running back position. Do you pay for a veteran or do you draft a guy? Right. Because there's so many great receivers coming out. And the reason I, I, you know, everybody I've ever asked this question to tells me the same thing. The proliferation of all these seven-on-seven camps that have been used to accelerate the development of quarterbacks. Somebody's catching all those passes after running those routes, and the receivers are developing at the same rate as the quarterbacks. And so there's a a lot of great receivers out there. They're they're incredible athletes, the best athletes on the field, arguably, but there's a lot of them out there. So you got to ask yourself, do we draft someone or do do we pay? And given recent history for the Giants, having a guy fall into your lap, who can get it done is a far better investment than going out and, and paying for an established name. Do you have time for two more questions, Mike? Sure. All right. Wide receivers, number one, guys. Uh, the pattern we've seen the last couple of years is the true number ones have not been reaching free agency, right? The team trades them before they get there, whether it's Devontae Adams, Tyree Kill, go down the list. So if you really want to get that number one wide receiver, do you and you want it to be a veteran, do you have to trade for him at this point? And or are we going to find a spot here where one of the guys actually does hit free agency? And I'm talking like a true number one, or is you're going to have to go the draft if, if you want to try to find that real alpha out there. I think they're going to have to, to go to the draft to find the true number one guy, the guy who commands double coverage, the guy who keeps the defensive coordinator up at night saying, Holy crap, how am I going to ever neutralize this player? I think you have to find him in the draft and, and look, there's plenty of great receivers in the draft, but yeah, we, you really can't draw a clear line between college production, NFL potential, and guy who's going to truly strike fear in the hearts of everyone who is out there on the field trying to deal with them. Um, so, yeah, we've seen this model develop, and it takes two sides of the coin to make it work. You need the team that is willing to invest draft picks and big money an established number one receiver. And then you have to have the team that's willing to let their established number one receiver go. It worked for the chiefs. It didn't work for the Packers. Right. So, and, and, and look with the Titans and the Eagles, I suspect Mike Vrabel based on how he reacted to the news that AJ Brown had been traded to the Eagles probably didn't work for the Titans very well to move on. Uh, and it seemed to work for the Eagles. So, and it worked for the dolphins. Now, did it work for the Raiders? I don't know. They got into a lot of other issues, but I, I think you're right. To get a number one receiver, you got to be ready to trade for him. And there has to be a team that's ready to trade the guy that they have. And there may be more names like that. There are plenty of guys out there that are due to be paid that may not get the money that they want from the team they have. And that team's mindset may be, we'll flip this guy we have into draft picks and try to replenish and replace him that way. So there may be some guys out there, but you're going to have to give up at least a first round draft pick to get them. All right, final question, Mike. We'll all be out at the Combine in Indy next week, which is basically an NFL convention, right? Everyone's out there. Everyone's talking to everybody. What are some of the things that you're keeping your ear out for that you think is interesting that could be happening around the league in the next three weeks that could really kind of mold and guide where the NFL is heading in the next couple of years in terms of player movement, stuff at the league level, ownership level, anything you're kind of keeping an eye on and your ear out for when you're in Indy next week? Without question, the number one issue that's pending is what's going to happen with Aaron Rodgers now that he's emerged from his darkness retreat. It's time for him to to let the Packers know what he's going to do because next week is the week to work out a deal. Next week's the week. If you're going to trade him to the Jets, trade him to the Raiders, trade him to wherever, Rodgers has to tell the Packers, first of all, I want to play. Second of all, I don't want to play for you. Third, here's where I'd like to go. Next week is the time to do it. You consider that the Jets have had Derek Carr in. 
And maybe Derek Carr's plan B and Aaron Rodgers' plan A, you got to know if Aaron Rodgers is going to be there before you pivot to Derek Carr. Meanwhile, Derek Carr may sign with the Saints or may go visit Carolina. Who knows? And that deal's done, and he's off the market before Rodgers has let anybody know what he's going to do. So I I'm paying very close attention to that because just before we we started this, I was taping an episode of PFTPM that'll be available later today, but it dawned on me, you know, we assume that Rodgers needs to let everyone know right now what he's going to do, but what if he would retire from the Packers now and then unretire later like Brett Favre did 15 years ago? Would teams who supposedly otherwise have their plans in place, like the Jets, the Bucks, and other teams would have done in 2008 with Favre, just throw their guy overboard and welcome Rodgers at the time training camp starts. So I wonder whether he feels the same urgency. He said he said he's going to make a decision so the Packers know. Well, it's one thing for the Packers to know that he's not going to be there. It's another thing for him to truly not be there and not unretire later and then force his way to whatever team he wants to play for. So the whole Rodgers thing looms over the NFL until we know what he's going to do. And uh, even if he retires, just like with Tom Brady, I, I won't completely believe that he's done. Mike, this was tremendous. I really appreciate the time digging into the Daniel Jones stuff. It was great content. I'll see you on Indy. I'll, I'll come by, say hi. Good luck, and uh, we'll talk soon, all right? All right. Appreciate it. Have a great weekend.